All right, if you will, take your Bibles tonight. Turn with me to the book of uh, the Gospel of Luke. The Gospel of Luke. So, Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4, we're looking at the miracles of Christ. I believe this is miracle number 5. Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4, verse 31. We're looking at the, the miracles of Christ still. And again, let me say this. Uh, so what relevance is there today concerning these miracles uh, of Christ? How does it apply to our own lives? Uh, so uh, we've mentioned many times, and I'll say it again just in recap, that uh, that if he worked miracles then, he still works miracles today because he is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. And I pray that you have been spiritually in tune enough uh, in your walk with the Lord to where you have seen uh, when he has worked miracles around you, when God has done things that only he can do. Uh, and so I believe all of these miracles that we read about, the, the, uh, the nine crowd-related miracles, we're going to see a little bit of one of those here in just a moment. And then the, uh, the, the 34 uh, or 35 uh, individual specific miracles. We believe every instance where a miracle is recorded, uh, that there's a reason for that miracle to be written in God's Word. Now remember, that's just the miracles that are recorded. That's not all the miracles that Christ did during his time on earth. But we have those that are recorded, and I believe they're recorded for our benefit, for our learning, for our encouragement, uh, to deepen our faith, and for our blessing. Uh, and so uh, keep that in mind as we look at these miracles. So tonight is very interesting uh, because tonight we're looking uh, at a miracle that's involving demons and, uh, and evil spirits, uh, which is so very interesting uh, to note as we look at God's Word. Uh, and so let's look uh, tonight right here in Luke 4, beginning in verse 31. Luke 4, verse 31. And the uh, Bible teaches us, uh, as we begin reading in Luke uh, 4, verse 31, that speaking of Jesus, and he came down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and taught them on the Sabbath days. Now this is also, if you're making notes, this is the first miracle that Jesus works, uh, and it may have been the only, I can't remember exactly, I've studied, but uh, in, uh, in the temple. But he came down and he taught them on the Sabbath day, and they were astonished at his doctrine, for his word was with power. Uh, and in the synagogue, this is where he's at in the synagogue, there was a man, which had a spirit of an unclean devil. He had a demon. He cried out with a loud voice, uh, confronting Jesus, in verse 34, saying, Leave us alone. What have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Art thou come to destroy us? I know thee who thou art, the Holy One of God. Now this is a demon speaking to Jesus. And Jesus rebuked him, saying, Hold thy peace and come out of him. And when the devil had thrown him in the midst, he came out of him and hurt him not. And they were all amazed and spake among themselves, saying, uh, What a word is this? For with authority and power he commanded the unclean spirits that they come out. And the fame of him went out into every place uh, of the country round about. And he arose out of the synagogue and entered into Simon's house. And Simon's wife's mother was taken with a great fever, and they besought him for her. And he stood over her and rebuked the fever, and it left her. And immediately she arose and ministered unto them. Now when the sun was setting, all they that had any sick with various diseases brought them unto him. And he laid his hands on every one of them and healed them. There's one of the group miracles we're talking about. Uh, and devils also came out of many crying and saying, Thou art Christ, the Son of God. And he rebuked them, uh, allowing them not to speak, for they knew that he was uh, Christ. That's very, very powerful, uh, what we read in this text. So, 
A couple of things that we want to look at here before we start really looking at the, the wording uh, of the text. Uh, so you need to understand that this is the first uh, of seven miracles where Christ cast out demons. The first of seven miracles where Christ cast out demons. Now as I was studying uh, the, sev- the seven miracles where he cast out demons, uh, I-, I could not help but notice the number of these miracles. Uh, and it is the number of seven, uh, which is that number of perfection or that number of completion. So this is the first of seven where he cast out demons. This is a reminder to you and I that though demons are very powerful, uh, they are not all powerful. Uh, they get their power and their assignment from Satan himself, uh, but Satan is powerful. He is more powerful than you and I, but he is not all powerful and he's not more powerful uh, than the God in which we serve. Uh, And so it's interesting to me that out of all of the miracles of Christ, seven of those, that perfect number, Christ deals with demons. It's almost as if there's a statement uh, being made just in uh, that number, and it's the, and it is this statement that that God is Lord of all, and He has all power, uh, even over demons. Now, let me say this uh, because this is very true today, uh, and some people don't get this. Uh, but uh, demons are very active in the world in which we live today. Now listen, if we open up this Bible and we, we, we go to prophecy tonight and we start teaching on Bible prophecy and current events and all of that, we're going to easily be able to line up Bible prophecy uh, with current events. Very easy with no stretch of the imagination. There's a lot of prophecy out there but that folks are preaching on, but they're having to stretch some things uh, to, try to, to try to preach it and add it up. But with no stretching needed, we can easily align Bible prophecy uh, with end-time events, with current events, I should say. And, and it would clearly show us these are end-time events. Well, uh, listen, if we can take the Bible and we see that know that, the enemy, the devil, he knows that as well. He's no dummy. They know the de- demons of hell. They know the Word of God. Uh, they know that we're living in those last days. Uh, and because of that, there is one last big push, one last big effort uh, by Satan and the demons of hell to stop the work of Christ in the world around us. So demons today are not only working in the world today, but demons today, I believe, are more active than they ever have been in any time in church history. Uh, and, uh, and, and that is to stop the work and the cause of Christ. So many times, listen, people get upset in the church about, about this taking place or that taking place or this person doing that or that person doing that. I want you to understand something. Uh, remember that, remember the Bible teaches us this. We battle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, and spiritual wickedness in high places. Literally, if we took that verse apart, what it's telling us is we battle against a devil's army that is in rank and file and has different different ranks. They have privates, sergeants, uh, uh, captains, majors, lieutenants, generals. The, 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 devil, the, the armies of hell are in rank and file and in order. And the Bible's very clear. Listen, we don't battle against flesh and blood, but we're battling against hell uh, and all of its armies. And what we have to remember is this, is listen, just as God uses people, to accomplish His work in this world. He energizes people with His Holy Spirit. Uh, He enables us to do His work, uh, whether it be on a mission field or just feeding the poor or uh, or clothing those without or standing in a pulpit or standing in a classroom or standing at Bible school. So So God empowers and anoints His people with His Spirit to do His work. Well, I want you to understand what the devil does. What the devil does is he energizes his servants, his uh, his demons to go out uh, and to lead and to influence and at times even possess people to do his work up on this earth. And so many times people are just letting the devil use them. And I've told you before, I'm not telling you the whole story, but I told you the story of a, of a man who that... Uh, when he was about 70 years old, we just had a terrible time with him in the church, and he caused so much trouble. He, he, 
he had been part of that church for, I don't even know about, well, I do know, it's about 30 years. Uh, he had single-handedly been the chairman of the deacon for 30 years. He had been the treasurer for 30 years. He had been the counting committee for 30 years. Uh, and, uh, and, and he had done everything and nothing was done in the church unless you went through this man. I mean, it was, he was the supreme authority. And when he realized he wasn't the supreme authority anymore, that we were going to pastor the church and the Lord was going to lead the church and that the church didn't belong to me as pastor and it didn't belong to him as a deacon, but the church belonged to the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and he caused trouble. And then new people were coming in and people were being saved. Uh, and, uh, and, and just all kinds of trouble come. And he caused a lot of trouble. And he was mad and he left mad. And years and years later, he come back 10 years later when he's 80 years old apologizing. And he said, listen, he said, and here's what he said. He said, I let the devil use me. That's what he said. I let the devil use me. So no, as a believer, you cannot be possessed by a demon. Uh, as a believer, you're filled with the Spirit of God and you, all, and you belong to God, so you can never be possessed by a demon. But as a believer, you can be used by the devil. And that's exactly uh, what had taken place. And so I want to tell you, when we think about demonic activity and we think about, number one tonight, how violent they are. I want you to notice how these demons were bold and they were violent. Uh, this demon in this man, he, he comes up and he just confronts Jesus. I mean, right out of the gate. Uh, and, you know, the Bible, uh, we see it in the wordings, how that this, this demon spoke to Jesus through this man. Uh, and he was possessed. Uh, but we need to be on guard that the devil doesn't use us. We need to be on guard for that. And, and so... We see, uh, we see demonic activity, but, but also I do want to say this. Uh, we see that this is one of three occasions, one of three occasions where Jesus cast out demons and those demons gave testimony, watch this, they give testimony to who Christ was. Now think about this. Think about this. Only in this world are there atheists. Only in this world where people claim that they don't believe in God. There's really no such thing as atheists. There's a such thing as fools who deny that there is a God. Uh, but there's truly no such thing as atheists. But there's people nevertheless that identify with atheism and they say they're atheists. But that's only in this world. We see three times in the Bible where demons in hell acknowledge who Christ is. And they acknowledge fully who Christ is. Just in this text here, they call him Jesus. Thank you, Elise, you did it right, right time. Just in this text here, they call him, number one, Jesus of Nazareth. You know what that is? That's identifying with the humanity of Christ. Because remember who Christ is. Uh, he was 100% man, but he's 100% God. Uh, we needed a sacrifice. We needed a sinless sacrifice. We needed a sacrifice that was in the flesh and the blood because God required a blood sacrifice uh, for the atonement of our sins. And so God came down from heaven, was robed in human flesh. And so the demons, they acknowledge the humanity of Christ. But they also, in this text, they also acknowledge Him as being, number one, the Holy One of God. They acknowledge Him as being the Son of God. And they acknowledge Him as being the Christ, the Anointed One, the Messiah. So they have acknowledged, number one, that He is the, uh, the, the humanity of Christ. And number two, they've acknowledged the deity of Christ. This is demons. Demons. Understand, demons can write a full statement of their belief in who Jesus is. They acknowledge the humanity of Christ. They acknowledge the deity of Christ. They have a full understanding of Christology. That's the doctrine and study of Christ. So they know who Christ is. I'm going somewhere with this. Just watch. But even at that, they cannot be saved and they will never be saved. This miracle, and I really wanted to talk more about demons, and maybe, maybe we can go back and just talk about demonology in a week or two. This text right here, and then another text, at least you can put James on the board. But this text right here shows us. Now watch this and hear what I'm saying. If you're watching on Liberty Live, I want to be very clear about what I'm about to say. 
This text that we have read tonight shows us very, very clear that head knowledge alone will not get you into heaven, period. It's got to be heart knowledge. You can't just know in your mind. Okay, you, if we're going to argue that, then what we're going to have to acknowledge and say is, is because these demons knew, they know Christology. They know who Christ is. They know He's the Son of Man. They know He's the Son of God. They know His humanity. They know His deity. They verbally acknowledge that He is the Christ. And so if we're going to say head knowledge is enough, then we're also going to have to say that all of these demons are saved and on their way to heaven or went to heaven, whatever the case. And that's not the case, folks. That's not the case. These demons acknowledged who Christ is. Head knowledge alone will not get you to heaven. James, put it up there, Elise. So here's what James says. What doth it profit, my brethren, though a man may say he has faith, but he has not works to back it up? Can faith save him? Uh, if a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled, notwithstanding ye give them not those things which are needful to the body, what does it profit? Even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. Yea, a man may say, uh, now, let me say what he said. He said, faith, if it has not works, is dead, being alone. So if you say you have faith, but you don't have works, it's dead. But if you have works and you don't have faith, then you're dead as well. Because good lost people help people many times. So church people aren't the only good people in the world helping folks. There's lost people who are feeding the poor, who are clothing the naked, uh, and who are helping those in need. There's lost people doing that because they've just got a heart uh, for humanity around them. Uh, so let's finish on. So uh, where's that? Verse 18. Yea, a man may say, though uh, thou hast faith and I have works, show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. Thou believest that there is one God. Watch this. Thou doest well. In other words, so you believe in God. You believe in Jesus Christ up here with your head. Well, that's good, James says. But the devils also believe and they tremble. But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? And literally, if you study this text out in the original text, in the original language, that word that the devils also believe, and what it's referring to is belief in the fundamentals of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The demons of hell, they believe in Jesus. So much more so than many in the world around us. They believe in his, to be, not to be repetitive, but let me remind you, they believe in his humanity, they believe in his deity, they have a full understanding of the doctrine of Christ and who Christ is. And they believe that he died on the cross, they believe he rose again on that third day, they believe in the fundamentals of the gospel. That's the way that word believe is used in God's word. It has to do with believing in the gospel. The demons believe the gospel. But they are not saved. No, they will. They never be saved because they cannot repent and they will not repent. And that's what separates them from you and I, my friend. If as a lost man, uh, God give me the faith to repent of my sins and to confess Him as Lord and Savior of my life. Uh, and so I was able to be saved. Uh, now, what I want you to see is this as we, as we look at as we close this out, really, we think about the, the two things I wanted you to understand is this. I wanted you to understand the violence of demons. The violence of demons. I want to tell you what demons will do. Uh, demons will destroy your children because they'll influence them uh, and they'll lead them and they'll, uh, they'll push them and they'll move them where they want them in, lifetime, in, in their life. Uh, demons are violent. They're very violent. It's confrontation. Go back and read the wording. But this, this man possessed of this demon just runs up into Jesus' face and confronts him. Very violent, very bold in their moves. Demons will destroy your church. Demons will destroy a nation. 
And see, keep in mind, in that file and ranking of demons, there's demons assigned to individuals. We know, the de- we know that the, the devil assigned 6,000 in one of these miracle cases we're going to read about. The devil had assigned 6,000 demons to one raving lunatic in a graveyard. 6,000. How many will he assign to somebody trying to live for Jesus? I wonder that so many times. So the devil, they have assignments and they have regions in which uh, they, uh, they try to lord over, if you will. So demons are assigned to individuals. Demons are assigned to homes. Demons are assigned to communities. Demons are assigned to churches. Demons are assigned to missionary efforts. Demons are assigned to nations according to God's Word. So demons are very, very violent and very aggressive. And they're also very deceitful and very smooth. And the Bible speaks of them disguising themselves as an angel of light. So let's move on. So the violence of demons, but I also wanted you to see the knowledge of demons. Those two things tonight, the violence of demons and the knowledge of demons. And the knowledge is this. They know exactly who Christ is. They know exactly who Jesus is. And so I want to encourage anybody here tonight, and I want to encourage, or someone here tonight, I want to encourage someone watching on Liberty Live tonight, if you watch Sunday service and you, and, and, and you heard Sunday's message, this some way, in some ways is kind of a, an add-on to that, but the teaching of this text from Luke is so, so plain because of what all the demons know about Jesus and they're not going to heaven, nor can they get to heaven. And friends, listen, I fear that our Baptist churches particularly, I can't speak to a Methodist church or, or uh, any other church. Now, I, I, speak, I speak to churches such as a Catholic church because I know their beliefs and their belief systems. Uh, and you, you can't fully believe in their belief systems and go to heaven. That's just the bottom line. So I can't speak to Presbyterian or you know, Methodist or Episcopal, any, any of those. But what I can speak to is Baptist churches. And I so fear that in our Baptist churches, we have many today that have only a head knowledge of Jesus Christ. And I believe today that accounts for why there's so much trouble inside of our Baptist churches. I believe that's why there's so much backbiting, there's so much, uh, there's so much division uh, I believe uh, many things in our Baptist churches can be accounted for because some people have just been in the church their whole life and all they have is a head knowledge of Jesus. So much head knowledge that they've taught Bible school, that they've taught Sunday school, that they've been part of a, a women's group, they've been part of a men's group because they have all this head knowledge of Jesus. But inside of themselves, they know when they go back that there was never a time and a place where they repented of their sins and confess Jesus as Lord. Faith and repentance, and confess Jesus as Lord. Where they realize, I'm lost, I can't save myself, and in whatever way you needed to pray it, Lord, save my soul, Jesus. I'm a sinner, I can't save myself. Please save my soul, Jesus. So in whatever way you needed to do that, whatever way it comes from your heart, but in some form or fashion, you need to know there was a time and a place when that took place, not when you were baptized, not when you were ordained as a deacon, not when you accepted a membership card from a pastor, not none of those things will get you to heaven. The only thing that will get you to heaven is is whenever you bow your heart. When you bow your heart and say, Lord, I'm a sinner. I know I need a Savior and Jesus is that Savior. Save my soul, Jesus. I will speak something to some of those denominations I mentioned just then. I will tell you this. So in a couple of those denominations, they have confirmation classes. And what a confirmation class is, is when you reach 12 years old in that church and in that denomination. Then you come to a confirmation class where you sit through a series of classes. And after that series of classes, learning about the church and learning about Jesus and about the Bible and so forth. So at the end of those classes, then there's a confirmation graduation, if you will. 
and all of those 12-year-olds or new people coming to the denomination, adults, whatever the case may be, they can go through these two. All these people that's been through these classes now come before the church and become church members. And so because you've been through a class, you are now a church member. Okay, are you with me? Because this, I want to be clear what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about you get saved and then you go through a new members class or a new believers class. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the way that you become part of God's church in their eyes is that at 12 years old, or if you come as an adult to that church for the first, you go through a confirmation class. At the end of that class, they say, hey, these are now our brothers and sisters in Jesus. They're now part of God's church. Well, friend, I, I want to tell you something. According to what we've just read tonight, you can sit through classes the rest of your life. And if you're just learning, 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 and it's all in your head and only in your head, you'll still die as lost as, as anybody sitting on a bar stool will die lost. So it's not about head knowledge. Okay, it, it's, we first learn it in our mind and we learn about repentance and we learn about faith and we learn about texts like these. Uh, we learn about who Jesus is. It first comes to our head. But then somewhere along the way, the Spirit moves it from our head to our heart. See, I had went through months of conviction, number one, but also went through some months of listening to preaching, 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 preaching. And, and this one preacher, he just kept preaching the gospel. I'm preaching the gospel. I'm preaching the gospel. I'm preaching the gospel. And so I'd, I'd been drawn by the Spirit, convicted by the Spirit, heard the Word, preached into my mind. And along the way, the Spirit moved it from my mind to my heart. And that's, why, that's, and that's when I give my life to Jesus. And that's why they say that many people miss heaven by 18 inches and die and go to hell. And that's the 18 inches between their heart and their head. Miss heaven by 18 inches. And so I pray tonight that you know there was a place and a time when you give your heart and your life to the Lord Jesus Christ. Not when you joined the church, not when you got baptized, how long you've been part of a church, how much money you've given in your lifetime, what positions you served, how many songs you've sung, how many sermons you've preached, how many mission trips you've been on, how many good deeds you've done in the community, uh, how well a reputation you have in the community, how noted you are in the community, none of that's going to get you into heaven. So when you die and you stand before God and God says, why should I let you into my heaven? Now watch, stay with me and I'm finished. You stand before God and God says, why should I let you into my heaven? What are you going to say? Are you going to say, well... Now, I did this, or I, I know I'm saved because I give to this cause, I give to that cause, or I led in this capacity, or I led in that capacity. I know I'm going to heaven because I got baptized. I know I'm going to heaven because I did this, or I did that, or I said this. I, listen to me. The only problem with all that is, is you're going to heaven, you think, because of all that you did. But I want you to know something. There's only one answer that will get you into heaven. If God says, why should I let you into my heaven? And that one answer is this. is because I've trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as my Lord and my Savior. And I ask Him to save my soul. That's the only thing that will get you into God's heaven. Nothing else will work. So we can't bring our works to get into heaven because they're no good. They're no good. Even the best works we do are as filthy rags compared to the holiness of God. But when we're saved and we're in Jesus, God doesn't see us in our works. He sees us in Christ, His Son. And so I pray we leave here. And I pray that you on Liberty Life, that you will, uh, you will know tonight when we dismiss that to be saved and to go to heaven, that you cannot follow the path that these demons followed. They weren't trying to get to heaven, but they had a head knowledge of Jesus. But I pray that you don't follow that path where you think head knowledge is enough. But I pray you'll realize I've got to ask Jesus for my heart to save my soul. And I tell you this, when he saves your soul, what a difference Jesus will make in your life. You'll be different. You'll be much, much different. So I just pray and I ask you, if you're on Liberty Live, you contact us. You let us know what Jesus has done in your heart. And if you're here tonight and 
You need to be saved because, well, you really never have been. You're no different than the demons we're talking about here. Your head is full of the knowledge of Jesus. But it's never been moved to your heart. I pray you'll catch me after service. Come to me, find me and say, I realize that tonight. I just want you to pray with me while I just tell Christ to save my soul. Save my soul, Lord Jesus.